Thanks. So I'm here today with Allison Armstrong, and Allison is an author, an educator, and unquestionably the mentor I have spent the most time with in the last year. Allison mm. has a diverse library of offerings, and I have literally done every single one of her courses <laughs> once, almost all of them twice, and a few three times, because I have gotten so much personal value and even professional value out of interacting with the content. So Allison, thank you for being here. You're welcome. I've really been looking forward to this. I'm so glad. Um, so your history in the study of human behavior has evolved in the last, well, since 1991. Where I'd really like to dive in with you first is um, I'd love for you to tell us what is partnership? Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. So as you know, the name of our company is PAX Programs and the P in PAX stands for partnership, um, adoration and ecstasy. Um, partnership is, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says on the same side or team or people engaged in an enterprise sharing its profits and risks. And from my attention to it over many decades, it's another planet. It's another paradigm. So if you think of life on earth as you've been there, we've talked about it in freedom from being ordinary, where it's characterized by scarcity or the perception of scarcity and competition <laughs> and the perception of threats <laughs> and opportunities. Um, if you think of that as the domain of instincts or survival, partnership is completely different. It's a it's a paradigm of human spirit, of we we-ness, not you or I, always we. So it's not how much power do I have or how much power do you have? If you have more power, we have more power. If I have more power, we have more power. So it's about, it's not a contest for power. It's literally empowerment. How do we be in an upward spiral? Um, it doesn't, it's different than leading and following. Um, it's providing and receiving. And it's and it keeps being interchangeable because providers often need something in order to be able to provide. So that turns them into a receiver. <laughs> and the person who was receiving is now providing to the provider in order to receive from. And the dance in which we do that determines how, how beautiful it can be, how fulfilling it can be, how much can be accomplished. Uh, miracles, well-being, vitality, all the goodies. All the goodies. All the all the goodies exist in those and we call them victories of human spirit because everything we've distinguished that partnership requires is um is a conscious choice over an instinctual compulsion. They're, they're in opposition. <laughs> so, and you know, I could I can talk for days and days and days and everything we do, even when we aren't using the word partnership, like we don't use it much in the beginning of our curriculum at the understanding level. We start to use it at the being extraordinary level. We're full on at the partnership level, obviously. Um, we don't use it much because most people think of partnership either as a business partnership a lot of businesses structured as partnerships, like you check that on the tax return, um, that aren't that are adversarial relationships. So we don't use it much there. And a lot of people, like I participated in an organization where all the men were looking for partners. They just really wanted their partner. And when, as I listened and listened, I found out what they meant was they wanted someone who would support them in everything that they were up to while requiring almost nothing from them. 
<laughs> so, so we don't use it much, uh, but it's what everything I do is about. And thank you for asking. Nobody's asked me that. You're welcome. And okay, so you specifically use the term adversarial. Yeah. Moment. And I'm curious if you could highlight the distinctions between partnership and an adversarial relationship, because what I'd love to explore with you next is this idea of what it means to have, to be a partner with one's own body. Mm -hmm. And so I think the distinction between partnering and having an adversarial relationship would be a great backdrop before understanding what it would mean to partner with yourself. Mm. Beautiful. Um, I would say that, and thank you for giving me the context where we're going, where in partnership, it's providing and receiving. And in an adversarial relationship, the focus is how do I get as much as I can from this person or situation while giving the least? <laughs> how do I how do I get the most? How do I take the most without giving up um, the least? And with giving up the least. And and I think think I think I shared this with you, Don. It was about two and a half years ago that I had the realization that I treated this body like I was the customer. And I'm always right. And it's wrong. <laughs> There's things it does well as it's supposed to. And and a whole bunch of stuff it it hasn't been right ever. Or maybe never will be right. And no matter what I do, it isn't right. Uh, sounds a lot like how we a lot of women interact with men. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's about getting and taking and keeping as much as we can from the other and protecting ourselves as much as we can from the other and risking, risking as little as possible, exposing, revealing protecting anything that could be used against us, uh, which, oh man, it just sets us up. It sets us up. Everybody's, everybody's guessing, everybody's, um, we, and, and this I find really interesting and in, given the context on, um, until last December, I never had, I, um, a pri a primary care physician, <laughs> for years, um, amazing human being, um, chiropractic, Chinese medicine, cranial sacral, visceral, visceral manipulation, taught cranial sacral for 30 years. She's one of my dearest friends. She took amazing care of my body. And about once a year, she'd take my blood pressure and, and listen to my heart, my lungs. And and it's it's a lot like relationships where we don't have all the information we need to to make better choices. So I didn't know, for example, that the way that I was eating in order to heal my gut was had me in high risk cholesterol. <laughs> and I, I didn't know. I didn't know until I it availed myself of what most alternative practitioners would call, you know, that modern medicine, what it's best at is diagnostics. And I didn't avail myself of all the diagnostics that I could have. I just guessed. I just guessed. I, I don't know what seemed right. Right. I didn't, I didn't start with very many facts and, and I almost did this again about a month ago. I, uh, <laughs> a dream actually woke me up to go get some facts. I was horrible abdominal pain and, um, horrible, like horrible. I, I had a, an app appendicitis. I had an emergency appendectomy many years ago. It reminded me of that. 
And I woke up in the middle of the night and was Googling uh, gallbladders and gallstones because of where I hurt that this dream woke me up to pay attention to this. It was literally a bear who had it, their, their teeth in that side of my body and was walking with me going, you're going to pay attention to this. <laughs> and the beauty of it was I had all these tests done that showed it was just this horrible, nasty GI virus going around and that that entire part of my body is doing great, right? That I haven't, I have no gallstones, perfect ducts. Everything's the right size, the right place, right? Everything. It, it was worth how painful that whole experience was just to find that out and to, and to know that I wasn't hurting my body, right? The corrections I'd made in my diet since I found out about the high risk, right? They were working and I was in partnership with it, with how this works. So I, I know I can get really excited about this, but yes, it has everything. And as you've heard me say, it, I purposely say this body, because if it's my body, it's hard to partner. If it's this body, there's me and this body. Now there's two of us and I can partner with it and be much more considerate and realize that I am not the customer, <laughs> that, I am, that I'm the one that's asking it to give me 30 more years than the actuarial ta tables say that I would normally do. <laughs> so that would require some special care. I'll Is stop what I hear in what you're saying, right? If I if I try to pull it all together, partnership Please. is this dance of giving and receiving. There's a mutuality, mm -hmm. and the focus is win-win. Right? How do we work in concert to make things better, individually and collectively? Yes. I think an adversarial relationship is a get take where there's secrecy, lack of revealing, and it's um, a bit more, I mean, it's antagonistic. I'm going to get as much as I can while giving as little as possible. What I see so often in our world is that we have a bit more of an adversarial relationship with our self, right? What you were saying, I'm the customer. I expect a lot. I'm right. So I'm entitled and demanding. And it's your job to give to me while I give you as little as possible in return. Do I have it so yeah. far? Okay. If I were to have a partnership with my body, then I could apply those same concepts of doing the dance of the giver becomes the receiver, becomes the giver, becomes the receiver because of this like accepts, acceptance of the mutuality. Mm -hmm. Right. I heard you speak once, it was the first time I was in LA with you, about what could be possible if we had an occupancy agreement <laughs> with our body. And I know that, that could take us down a long path. Could you give us some of the highlights of like what that might mean to actually have that sort of a, like an agreement, a contractual agreement with yourself about what goes in, how it's used, who can visit? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I love, I've never gotten to do this with anyone. So just thank you. Uh, because everything that we do in romantic relationships, family relationships, friendships, business work, everything we do with that, we do with our bodies, including right off the bat, we mostly interact in, 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 in expectations. And we have expectations of what our body will, will be capable of. We even, we have an expectation, like we, we think that I'm the landlord, I decide. Uh, hello, where does eviction happen? <laughs> Pretty sure that this is the landlord and this gets to evict what I consider myself. 
as an e eternal being, right? I, I get evicted from my brief occupancy of this and it decides. Now, I know there are people who, you know, and they're legendary people who've decided, okay, I'm going to go now. <laughs> and they lay down and they die. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Um, so I, I know we can leave, but mostly we are ejected. And being present, um, you know, I've never talked about this much, but being present to my husband being evicted from the body he was occupying after tons of uh, delayed, uh, what do they call it? It's not delayed. When your house, when you postpone the maintenance, deferred maintenance, but it's worse than that. It's like it, there's a neglect, right? Um, and ay, 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 ay. So yes, occupancy agreement. We all have an idea of how we think we want to die, but who really decides? We don't like to um, we either have an expectation or we just don't even want to go there. We don't even think about it. And um, I've been listening to a book recently that's deeply disturbing, partly because the author reads it himself and, and by his own admission at the end, I wish he'd done it at the beginning, he is pushy and strident. <laughs> which is hard for me to be around pushy and strident, but it's called die with zero. And, and it has to do with our relationship to our health and our experiences in life and money. And, um, and it's what had me challenges us to go to a life expectancy calculator and find out what is predicted and start interacting with that in a material way. And, but mostly we're just, just like in relationships, expectations and hallucinations. We have such hallucinations. And my father, who was, um, he, he, he was in a, a very, had a very high need for adventure. He was athletic and brilliant and consumed large amounts of alcohol. It's starting in his teens. And uh, he would never say that he was an alcoholic, but his body would literally start shaking apart if he didn't drink alcohol. And he, I mean, he took his body for everything it had. <laughs> Towards the end, he could have died from at least four different causes at any moment. And he he lived until he was, let's see, I was there with him on his 82nd birthday and he died a couple of weeks later. So, um, but I mean, he took it for everything while, while just not providing much for it that it needed. It was a spectacular body. And the funny thing was about five years early, he had, had called me and it, I know this was probably the hardest call for him to make. He said, Allie, I've outlived my money. <laughs> he had expected to die younger. <laughs> and we'd had a conversation about money when I was 21. I, Cause my dad was a trust fund baby. And I noticed I was just, he was only 22 years older than me. No, 21. So, you know, I was expecting him to die and I'd get his money. And in it, I realized that as I began interacting with transformation, that that didn't empower me. And I, so I just asked him, dad, how do you want me to think about your money? And he said, well, I have a life insurance policy for you and your brothers. Um, besides that, I'm going to spend it all. And he set me free, right? He set me free when he did that. And I think that's what happens when we're telling the truth. Like this could evict me at any moment. So now what? There's like a freedom in partnership, right? And since this is what we're trying to accomplish, what do you need? And, you know, we were joking about, about be complex, <laughs> 
<laughs> before we started. And one of the things that I popped into my mouth, my handful of, of pills, um, is uh, literally food for the librarian. That as we get older, and I'll be 64 in a couple of weeks, as we get older, it's not that our memories fail, it's that the librarian is so tired and doesn't have enough nutrients to run back and forth <laughs> to collect the information. So it's suited precisely for that. And I've actually, it actually works. Like I actually have my employees sometimes say, Can you take some of that brain stuff now? I need you to think faster. <laughs> I love so. hearing you describe the librarian. I've always, um, I, I've always said to people, I don't have a great memory. I just have a great secretary. She hands me the files that I need when you ask me of the question. Yeah. Like, if somebody were to say, Dawn, tell me what you know, I'd go, I don't know anything, right? But ask me a specific question and she just hands me that file. That's awesome. Off we go. Yeah. Okay. You said... A moment ago, the word I need. So, um, Allison, you and your body of work have helped me to make peace with the words I need in a mm -hmm. way that um, I could never have imagined. I was so proud of my fierce determination to not need mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Yeah. And the way that you help me to make peace with the words I need is by connecting the words I need to in order to. Mm -hmm. You help me to understand that as a soul, I need nothing. Yeah. You know, as a body determined to live a particular way, <laughs> then mm -hmm. my needs for, you know, air, water, nutrition emerge right wondering if you could um help to just illuminate this concept of like what are our capacities and how how do the the, the capacities that we have access to whether it's patience compassion energy various forms of vitality how do they mm. connect to what we need in a, in a way that might give us more access to asking for what we need and tending to what yeah. we need. So let's see, how many minutes do you want me to spend on the content we have in being extraordinary as a woman and being extraordinary as a man? <laughs> give me 10, I got two more questions for you. Give us 10, 15 minutes on this one if you can. Oh, wow, that's a lot. That's awesome. Up to um, up to okay well i was talking to a man a few days ago um about something that typically we see in men and that is that they hold themselves to account for high performance but they believe that until they perform at that level and based on having performed at that level, then they deserve to ask for and be given certain things. But it's backwards. Like until they're given those certain things, they can't perform at the level that they think they should perform at on fumes. And women are the same way. We have... We have these very high standards for not only um, a work ethic, <laughs> how clean our houses should be, how organized our space should be, how out of hand the laundry can get, um, how many home cooked meals we're supposed to prepare. We have all those kinds of standards, but then we also have standards for um, accomplishment, performance, achievement, and even not just for ourselves, but also we measure ourselves by our offspring. So we have standards for them. And, and then on to have standards of how we should be able to be, like you mentioned, patience. Um, and I think we pay a lot more attention to being 
as we, I don't know if it's grow older, but as we see life in more dimensions, at whatever age that happens, where we start to see that how someone is being has a bigger impact than what they're doing and what they're saying, how they're being. So like I took on when my children were young, I took on that what I most wanted to be as a mother was patient. That's what I most wanted to be. And it came from observing what happened to the three of them and to each of them when I was and wasn't patient. They literally could be different people. If I were impatient, they were somewhere in fight, flight, freeze. They were either attacking, defiant, <laughs> belligerent, um, or just locked down, <laughs> I'm not gonna, right? Or sullen, withheld, just disappear, won't interact, won't participate. Where if I were patient, meaning I, I, I had plenty of time. I had plenty of time they could go at their own pace. If we were late, that was less important than that they were in good shape, right? That they were late for school. Ideally, it would be on time for school. Yay. Um, but if I wasn't going to have them be a mess to make sure we complied with the school's regulations that didn't really seem to care much about the well being of my children. <laughs> Later on, all kinds of things happen with that. My my elder daughter, she went no, she didn't go to school more than three days a week because it literally made her physically ill. And um, and she got way better grades by not going to school. It's hilarious. Um, but anyhow, so so if we look at something like patience or if a woman wants to be gracious, kind, generous, serene, even focused, right? Focused, you know, which is associated with levels of testosterone. And women have a fraction of the testosterone that men naturally have. So all of these things like rest, sleep and rest builds testosterone in both men and women. So if we're trying to go without as much sleep as our bodies and brains are telling us they need, and yet we're demanding of our body and brain to achieve all of those things we expect of it without giving it what it needs, it doesn't work. And we might get by enough to think that it does work before it all breaks down. And... And we have so many autoimmune conditions and um, chronic fatigue. We have so many things in, at least in our society here, I don't keep track of the whole rest of the world, but they're all from these stunning expectations that aren't met by giving these physical bodies an extraordinary amount of what has it work. And, and I think part of it, Don, I don't know what you think about it, but I think a lot of it has to do with life expectancy, like what's happened to life expectancy and that, you know, what I've learned about just, for example, women's fertility and how, you know, in utero, we have the we have millions of ovum. Most people think of them as eggs, right? We have millions of them. By the time we're born, <laughs> we're now into the hundreds of thousands. They've already dissolved and disappeared. And then we're in the hundreds of thousands. And then we think, you know, well, it's just the one that ripens every <laughs> 30 days or so, right? No, they're dissolving and degrading constantly. And, you know, I wanted to have a, a fourth child later in life. And Greg and I forgot we get a right. We've not been dominated by, no, we can't afford it. And 
and the doctor was like, I thought we just had to reverse his vasectomy. And he's like, so you're, you're going to be looking for a, a donor? I'm like, no way. <laughs> no way am I going to look for a donor. And he's like, uh, you're 42. So I, I didn't know that by about 37, we have less than 10,000 ovum. And most fertility doctors don't consider that even worth harvesting. Now, it's the only time in my life when I was happy to be called plump. They did an ultrasound and my ovaries were plump. <laughs> he still gave me a 10% chance of having a biological child. We don't even pay attention to that realistically, right? Um, but, you know, when I found out that almost all of our estrogen and half of our testosterone comes from those ovum that are disappearing. And so when I was terrified that I, my short term memory, like something I committed to the day before, I didn't remember. And then I was terrified because of my integrity that people could now tell me I'd committed to something and hold me to it. And I wouldn't know whether I had or not. I was so afraid of that. And then thankfully I expressed it to the right person. <laughs> Because I thought it was because of menopause, which, you know, most people don't even know what menopause is. <laughs> the anniversary <laughs> of the first day of your last period. <laughs> that, that lasts one day, menopause. It's one day. Then everything else is premenopausal or perimenopausal. And everything else is postmenopausal. And I thought it was because of menopause and the loss of estrogen. And, and this doctor said, short-term memory is associated with testosterone, not with estrogen. What? What? And then, you know, all my prejudices about hormone therapy and that had been born out of the studies that had happened when I was younger from horse urine and a very small very, very small group that was studied on and blown up everywhere that it would cause cancer. All of that got called into question and I couldn't have the life that I have if I didn't get to regulate testosterone and estradiol and progesterone at the levels that I would have naturally had at about 35 years old. If I didn't do that on purpose I couldn't I couldn't express all my passions I couldn't I couldn't contribute the way I'm committed to contributing and you'll laugh at this Don I have an appointment with my HRT doctor today because my last testosterone total testosterone results um which they retested and it came out with the same result. And so now I'm getting tested someplace else because it was 1,451. So you're like a 21 year old male. <laughs> well, what I said was, I know that's wrong because if it were true, I'd be chasing my boyfriend around <laughs> and I would be like, temper waiting to boil over. I would be a, not even an inert volcano. I would be on the edge of blowing because when I first started the therapy, my body was so receptive. I was in the 200s and somebody said something that made me mad and my body felt like an atomic bomb that was going to take out the whole valley. And that, that was what clued me into, I, I don't think anger is the same for women as for men. We we should investigate this. <laughs> and so I did. Um, but yeah, I it, the results have to be wrong. I know how I would be if, <laughs> if I had 10 times my happy place, right? I'm really happy around 150. So, and not too hairy and not too horny. <laughs> Well, listen, what I hear in what you just said right, is that there's something really powerful about knowing yourself. Right? There's a sweet spot. Yes. And yes. before I ask you the next question, I want to take a step back and see if I can connect some of the 
concepts and have you clarify if I'm wrong. Um, Please. Okay, so I heard you use the term life expectancy, which mm. has embedded in it the idea of expectation. Yes. You know, that I think that part of where we go wrong, in a sense, is that we have we bring expectation to life. Tons, all the time. It, it won't tell you because it's ordinary you know, or it's just what should happen. Right. I won't appreciate it if you do it because it's just what you were supposed to do. Yeah. But I'll be mad as hell if you don't. You know, it is sort of the essence of an adversarial relationship. Yeah. That is almost like infused into us just through the word life expectancy. Just expect it. Yeah. Just something to do in order to live that way. But you are entitled to be angry if it doesn't work out. Yes, I, well, and the funny thing is, and you know, I talk a lot about expectations, um, especially in connecting through conflict and in, and in lux and in freedom from ordinary, I talk about it everywhere because it is the mischief maker. And, and you know, when I started studying men in 1991 and and I had very low expectations of them. I, I knew they had no feelings, so nothing I did would hurt them. I knew they were lesser beings than women. I I truly questioned if they had souls. I, I, I was doubtful that these creatures had souls. How could they act that way if they had a soul? So my, <laughs> my expectations, and I expected them to be mean and nasty and they either didn't care about what I needed or they were withholding it on purpose. But even what you might consider low expectations, those those were a ridiculous set of expectations in another way. And thankfully they trashed all of them. But when I started, we started our workshop in 1995 and I was trying to interact with women about expectations and that we if we changed our expectations of men, we had a much better chance of satisfaction. And I mean, so many times there were women who were vehement that to lower one's expectations would have the results be worse. Like that along with expectations is the expectation that an expectation causes itself to be met. And it doesn't, it actually causes itself to not be met. Because as you said, part of what goes with it is this just should happen and I shouldn't have to say anything about it. And why should I appreciate someone for doing something they should do? They should just do it. I mean, it's the easiest way to tell the existence of an expectation is the word should It, it's like I already earned it. I I already deserve that. I already earned it. I'm entitled to it. And WTF, you haven't delivered. Even, and you may have been there when I was talking about it. We we have expectations, of God, and many people are pissed. <laughs> They're so mad. <laughs> um, it's fascinating to me. Okay, so. I want to take us in a slightly different direction because just like the words I need have yeah. set me free in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, Can I, I say something about that before you leave? I need sure. Okay. Just, just because I know women are listening and I need is huge for men and women to say, and um, I just want women to know somewhere around 20%. I used to think it was only 15. I think it's closer to 20, maybe even more. Um, if you're not going to die without it, like really die, um, about 20% of men think if you say, I need, and you won't die without it, that you're lying. I need a new pair of black shoes. <laughs> I asked my son this. What would you think if I said I need a new pair of black shoes? He said, I'd think you were lying. <laughs> like, oh, you're one of the 20%. Um, and 
and and so for men, they will often only say they need what they will die without. And their standards are way low because it's not die eventually, it's die immediately. <laughs> where, I mean, there are studies that show that the sleep we're not getting now is coming off of the end of our life. <laughs> it's just taking years off from the other end and we're not aware of it. Um, but so there's two, two other words that men tend to use and respond to. One is I require, because even though if you look, I need up in the dictionary, it says an urgent requirement of something. Um, I require is more in order to, like it sets up that in order to. I require in order to. In order to do that, I require this. So in a in transactional, it's fine. Um, but another word that works is important. Men will usually say what they need in order to be happy, in order to be satisfied, fulfilled, patient, um, as focused as they'd like to be, as aware, considered as they'd like to be. Well, it's important to me. You know, why can't we have the birthday party in the middle of the day on Sunday? Because that's my golf game. Well, just don't golf that day. It's important to me. And, and we think that's stupid. How can a golf game be important? And so we don't say, what makes it important? <laughs> I mean, if we were honestly curious, oh, it's important to you. What makes it important? Well, when I golf, mm, for at least five days, I'm more focused, patient, patient, present, affectionate, content, at ease, have less frustration. <laughs> like, golf, honey, go golf. <laughs> How about... Do you need to golf in the middle of the week too? Because it does kind of run out by Friday. <laughs> With Greg, it was motorcycle riding, right? <laughs> Go. I don't feel like motorcycle riding today. Go. <laughs> um, so important or require. And I, I would play. I would play with I need, I require, it's important to me. And, and anywhere you can make headway in expressing those things is good. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification around that. And asking them and saying, what have you done? I don't need anything. Well, what's important to you? What would give you the most capacities for what you want to do and be? And then imaginary duct tape. And he probably still have to think about that and get back to you. Okay. Take hours, days. I, I'm willing to wait for the answer because it's important for me to know what's important to you. That's why women get so excited when their men do being extraordinary as a man and they end up with a whole chart of what <laughs> they require in order to be what they're committed to being. It's like a miracle. The ch I mean, I, I can't say enough about being extraordinary as a woman. The chart, it's illuminating yeah. to really think if I'm committed to being energized, what, what do I need that would provide that? If I'm committed... I mean, in so many areas, right? Like, um, just to think about what does this situation require of me? Who must I be? Mm -hmm. And for different situations, right? If I'm interacting with my son, it's really different than if I'm spending time with friends, you know, or with a significant other, but to put that first and you'd highlighted something earlier or, or mentioned it. I'd like to highlight it. The idea that we typically think I have to earn it before I can give it to myself. And I love how you flip the equation. If you don't give it to yourself, you can't be it. Hmm. it. It just doesn't work when we do it the other way, which is actually what brings me to my next question, um, which is about the word enough. Hmm. Enough I have found is access to freedom and freedom is your highest value. But really connecting it back to health and vitality, I'd love for you to speak to us about what happens when we attempt, how do I want to say this, to get to a particular place, but mm -hmm. we're coming from the insufficiency. Like if we're below enough and then we try to, you know, put icing over that, mm. but I learned from you is that it doesn't work. 
So tell us why and what we can do instead. Oh boy. I don't know. You might be rivaling best student of mine category. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see. I'm going to kind of start in the middle and go backwards. So knowing one's highest values, what we would call your noble qualities, is key to having us pay attention to what matters the most because of, we call it the ideal woman or the perfect person, um, thinking we we should be great at everything. We Our standards, and that we didn't even make the standards, right? It's, it's all survival-based. So knowing what your highest values are, and therefore, if you're the embodiment of that, and literally, I mean embody. So what you have as a spiritual value is in your physical body, and you know it is because you can find it. Patience is a feeling that has a place in everyone's body. Not necessarily in the same place, but it has a place. And you can check and see how much patience do I have. That's why, as you know, we call it a tank. How full is my patience tank? And the flipping thing you were talking about, when I realized what I most wanted to be for my children was patient, then I had to reverse engineer what puts patience in my body and finally figured out it was a, not only a certain amount of sleep, amount of sleep that began by a certain time of night. And I, instead of staying up and cleaning some more, organizing some more, picking up after the whole hoard some more, I literally would, I called it the sleep slide. <laughs> because as women, we can't just lie down and fall asleep. We, there's still too much going on up there. So I'd start the whole sleep slide and everyone's got their own in time to be asleep as close to that optimal, it's around 10 o'clock at night as I could. And so that I woke up having had enough sleep and was naturally, I didn't work at being patient patience. I had patience. And so it just was drawn on. It was drawn on. And as, as you know, I've upped my standards in the last few years. I don't want to just have the tank full. I want my tanks overflowing that I am literally overflowing as freedom. I'm overflowing as truth. I'm overflowing as partnership and empowerment and contentment. Those are, those are my six highest qualities right there. Um, my five engagement would be number six. So it's enough, enough. I would, con I would consider enough. It is going to depend on how long you have to draw on that tank. When do you get to fill up again? So as you know, another part of the chart is, okay, if I have that much sleep starting at that time, I'm going to have patience until when? And I started paying attention to when would I run out of patience. It was about eight o'clock at night. I would run out of patience the next night. It didn't last 24 hours. Marvelous that my husband took on at his own volition, putting the kids to bed. Because at that time I had nothing to put the kids to bed. In fact, I didn't even care if they went to bed. They could fall asleep wherever they were. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably why he put them to bed. He did care. Oh, God bless him. So enough, we to answer your question, so enough would be if, wait, I'm looking at how you guys are looking. So if this was the domain of human spirit and this was the domain of human instincts and they're completely different, even though they can look the same because for example, the hierarchy of instincts, procreate, then protect, then provide, has its expression in human instinct, has its expression in human spirit. I, <laughs> I call it passion, peace, and power when it's in human spirit. And enough is the line. Enough is the line between human spirit, human instinct and human spirit. But the trick is, 
human instincts have no enough switch. Like I like to say, we'll men will hunt until we have to buy storage facilities and, and freezers to put everything in it, huge freezers. Women will gather until we're over, our homes are overflowed with what we gather. The in instinct to hunt and gather doesn't have an enough switch. We've hunted enough. Like just look at money. Every time you try to decide how much money is enough, a whole new amount shows up. And so enough, I call enough the first choice. And freedom means the power to choose, which is why it's so important to me, the power to choose, to say this is enough. And contentment, my fifth noble quality, the definition of contentment is happy enough with what one is or does or has. And that's my spiritual practice, contentment. And so enough is a decision. And for women, especially one of the most important decisions to make, choices to make is I am safe enough. That's the beginning of our freedom from our own instincts. I am safe enough. Um, for most men, it's I've provided enough. I have provided enough. I am providing enough. I've done enough. So I forget the rest of your question because it was a huge question. <laughs> so Thank you for that. So the question is what happens when we try to make something better, but we're coming from not enough. Yes. Uh, it, it never fixes it. It'll never, ever fix it. And it, I think it's why it's good to set things that are measurable. Like um, with my, my backpacking uh, guru, uh, she had to be mindful of that I could hurt myself by over conditioning for a backpacking trip. So I had to have measurable standards. If I could hike eight miles, averaging um, in the mid 20s per mile, carrying 38 pounds um, in my backpack, I was in condition. I, I conditioned myself enough. If I could do that, good enough. <laughs> and, but that, those measurements and, and I think it's, we have to apply it to, am I patient enough? Am I focused enough? And I, am I affectionate enough? Am I, am I alive enough? Am I vital enough? And again, that's going to bring up, well, enough for what? My measurement was enough for the trip that she was planning for us. <laughs> she knew the terrain. She knew how many miles we'd be doing a day. She knew, she knew everything about it. That would be enough. Now, that's what happens from having someone who's masterful, right? My, my guru summited Rainier three times, summited Kilimanjaro, my gosh, right? I mean, she's been doing this for decades. She's someone who could tell me what was enough. And I think that's why we need, we need masters in their own field, right? Who can, who can say this would be, this could be a sweet spot for you. Let's try for this. We'll check in again. We'll see what capacities you have, right? Whether it's your total testosterone or it's, how much you're sleeping or how much you're moving your body or sometimes we need help with someone saying that's enough. We need, I, I had someone awesome in money. Look at my 401k and what it was invested in and how much was invested in it. And, and he told me all about it. And then I said, so what should I do? He said, it depends on what is the purpose of this money. I never thought about the purpose of my retirement money. Don't you just save retirement money to save retirement money. And when I figured out the purpose and I told him, he goes, well, then that means you've saved enough. What? Aren't I supposed to do this endlessly? <laughs> oh, oh, he goes, I recommend you keep doing as much as your company matches. That would just be smart. 
Um, but you don't need to. It really highlights why enough is access to freedom. Yeah. I think about the, it's one of the things that's so common with the women that I work with is that, um, they're sleep deprived, right? They'll come to me because they're exhausted. Yes. They're exhausted because they're sleep deprived, but they put their kids to bed and then they say, this is the only quiet time I get all day long. Right. So I either sit on the couch or lay in bed and, you know, watch something on Netflix. I scroll Instagram. And then before I know it, it's 1 a.m. And I and the alarm goes off at six. And, and I'm just like, okay, well, what? It's not enough sleep. Great. But I feel like this idea, like you have a say, it's going, well, what's enough alone time, bef- you know, to refill the tank before I go to sleep so that I can get enough sleep. And even hearing in some of your language from earlier, is my house clean enough so that I can shift and do something else? It, like just this word enough appears all over the place and allows us to do something else. Right. So can, can I tell you a different version of that? That is, is what women do, right? We do almost everything at the last possible moment including taking our alone time. So I was just talking about this this morning. Um, My first call asked me, you know, how was I doing? Did you get a good night's sleep? And I said, I had a perfect night's sleep. Um, I I set the alarm for when I needed to be up and I woke up almost two hours before that. And and that's a way to know I have enough sleep because I my eyes pop open. I look around, oh, I'm awake. But so, and that's when, so I get my alone time at the beginning of my day, fresh from having gone to bed earlier when it works better for my mind and body to go to bed, which is, would be shortly after the kids, (laughs) right? If I still had them around, but go to bed earlier, start the sleep side. And I even have an alarm to tell me to start going to sleep, do start right um and and so so what if we took our alone time at the beginning of the day what if we treated ourselves first instead of last what a novel concept and yes i i I don't know if you are but i know you like the power of win and i am a lion you're all I am okay, a lion. Cool. Most days I am awake by 5 30 and I get all of my alone time before anyone else uh-huh. wakes up. You know, yeah. so that that to me is natural. Right. That would be. You know, should we tell them about the power of when or do you do that already? No, because I have another question for you. Okay. okay. But we're gonna run out of time. But yes, read the power. I'm look it up. The power read of when the power of when. It's fantastic. Yeah, get get it's the very... power of quiz.com. Just go do it. Okay. It's What's a really liberating thing for me to realize like, oh, I am a lion and a lot of other people aren't. Yes. You know, so please don't ask me to do anything after 9 p.m. <laughs> I will do anything that you need by 6 a.m. <laughs> okay, so um, I do have one more question for okay. you. And for this, I think I imagine that you'll be pulling from your personal experience as well as what you've observed in all of the couples that you've worked with. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'd really like to hear, you know, well, okay, I'm going to back up and preface this. One of the big motivators to die to dive into your work. I mean, and I have, as you've noted, I've studied your work, and a big piece of it is because. The big driver and what comes through my door is stress. And mm-hmm. I find that a primary contributor to the stress in our world right now is relationship disharmony. And it mm-hmm. felt really disempowering for me as a physician to hear people speak of conflict and turmoil, like everything that we might describe as the natural consequence of having an adversarial relationship mm-hmm. with your significant other. And then not knowing what to do with that. And so I said, well, I need to study this. I need to understand because not knowing what to do about such a substantial source of stress 
does it work? Yeah. So my question for you, having been in this conversation for 30 years, is what do you observe shift in people's lives when they're able to cultivate relationships rooted in partnership rather than being adversarial? Like what are the, let's say the side effects <laughs> in the positive domain? Wow. Your questions are so fun because I think I know where they're going. Then you say one more thing and then it changes direction. And then you say one more thing and it goes enough. And then, I like being surprised. Um, so I would say, my, I'm going to give up the contrast, right? So when we shift from expecting people to know what we need, know what it would look like, know why it's important, and therefore we don't have to say anything about that. Um, when we shift from thinking people are misbehaving instead of what if, what if everyone's always giving you their best interpretation of what they heard you say? And they may only have heard a fraction of what you said, <laughs> which is why I would always say to my kids, like, well, you said, and I'd say, you can tell me what you heard, but do not tell me what I said. Um, we have too many filters that are filtering out too much important information. So if we, if we shift to that, and we're giving a kind of benefit of the doubt and, and asking what's my part, right? And, and you know, my entire curriculum about is what's your part and what's not your part. Men think they're supposed to make women feel safe and make people, make women happy. And they cannot do either one, right? So as we shift into being responsible for what is our part and we stop taking everything personally because what's wrong with me compounds the stress, right? Right. What if nothing's wrong with you? What if you were born human and your instincts are at odds with your fulfillment? <laughs> and what if men and women have opposing instincts? And so we naturally antagonize each other. No one has to decide to be antagonistic. Our instincts have us antagonize each other all the time. So in shifting out of that, like what are the small adaptations we can make with the biggest benefit, like taking turns? What if instead of trying to have a conversation, we took turns? So no one got interrupted. Everyone got to be heard all the way through. You can even set a timer. So it was equal. Simple thing like that can change life. And then all of a sudden, it, it feels like magic, but it, it's just the upward spiral when you're doing what works you have more ease it begins with clarity right you begin with clarity then you have more ease and then in that ease generosity becomes natural you can shift into giving and receiving instead of taking and protecting and it life feels fun Life feels fun. And even when it's hard, it's like, yeah, but we're in it together. We can do this because we're in it together. And it's one of the things that I learned from men when I talk to them about who they choose to marry. And, and one of the things that they said over and over again is they're looking to see when we have a problem, do you make me the problem or do we solve the problem together because there's that's what they're used to is being accused of being the problem instead of we have a problem no the problem is you buddy and so it's I, near as i can tell what most people say they want they want passion safety connection intimacy caring support 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 right all of that is a natural outcome by shifting the way that we approach this think from thinking it's supposed to work instead of no it's really doomed <laughs> we need to wake up we need to get educated 
and we need to figure out what what if this is my part and what's the smallest adjustment sorry my timer went off what's the smallest adjustment that i can make to to give the most and it's really the reverse of what we talked about so what do you most need to give? Because we all need to give and we won't be fulfilled unless we can give what we need to give, right? So what do I need to give? And what's the least I need in order to keep being happy to give? In, instead of how do I get the most and give the least, right? How do I give the most while well, getting enough of what I need to keep being happy giving what I have to give? Thank you. You're welcome. You asked huge questions. We could talk for days, as you know, about each one. Each one and each nuance of each one. I mean, it's been 34 years since I started studying men. And thank thank goodness I have. <laughs> Even just my, just my own personal life, thank goodness I have. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your dedication to learning from everything I've learned and how you're implementing it and helping other people with it. Oh my gosh. It has, yeah. it's been a pleasure. And um, I couldn't advocate strongly enough for those watching and listening. Like, just bite the bullet and do the curriculum. <laughs> Just do the whole curriculum, but <laughs> really, Allison, because, um, you know, what I see every day is the impact of that adversarial relationship. I mean, really, like, it, it's like the tagline of this interview series is that you cannot hate yourself into health and happiness. Mm. You can't hate your partner into transforming either, you know, <laughs> but I think that your work is the essence of embracing that pleasurable path, the win-win, the spiral upward, the dance of collaboration, you know, in, in stark contrast to compromising and giving something up and hoping for the best. Yeah. So um, thank you for what you do. Thank you for going on this adventure with us today. I do know that I threw you some curveballs and I just appreciate <laughs> how gracious you can be. I also mm -hmm. know that you have an event coming up and if you'd like to share about it and invite people, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, um, I will. And you and I had spoke at the beginning about if I had a gift for your audience and I said, yeah. let's see what naturally flows out of the conversation. And, and I know what it is. Um, it's causing those loving feelings, mm. right? Because I apply my engineering brain, this engineering brain, I don't know if it's mine or not, <laughs> I'm borrowing it, um, to, to literally reverse engineering the difference between love as eternal and infinite, loving feelings like that happening in our chest being in love, the soap bubble, and by breaking those down, how do we end up loving ourselves? How can we cause love for ourselves, which is exactly what you're just talking about. So um, so I'll make sure you have the information so you can give that to your audience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then on October 22nd, on our website is a, a place to click to register for it. It's a free event. I've never done anything like this before. It's a collaboration with Sean Callaghy of Unblinded Mastery. And we get to dispel the idea that what works in business, how come it doesn't translate into romantic relationships? Like people, successful people are mystified. And what I propose is, propose is that it doesn't translate because it doesn't work in business either. <laughs> that it's just in business where we're dependent upon paychecks and promotions and career paths and status, we will put 
up with, being interacted with in ways that we'll only put up with in romantic relationships to the degree that we think we're dependent upon those as well. And as you know, um, you know, my standard for our smart singles is really take a hard look. Are you better off with or without that person? <laughs> and you don't have to be perfectly better off, but you need to be enough better off or don't be with them. And um, we're fortunate in first world countries as women um, to no longer be dependent upon romantic relationships to survive. And it, we have to take hold of that. That's why really for the first time ever, partnership is a real, it can be real for all of us. But we still have these ideas of dependency that keep us hooked in. So anyhow, so it's called Mastering Men, Women, and Money. And um, it's going to be very fast paced and to the point. And Sean Calgi is a, is a kick. We are students of each other and teachers of each other. And it's uh, it's free, October 22nd. But I'll make sure you have the information for both of those. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity today. You're welcome. My pleasure. Great to be with you.